What is love? Is it possible to answer this question? Love is a universal force. Love is a principle of life. Love is the ultimate reality of everything that exists. Or maybe it's just a delusion. This or that way, um, love is one of the biggest human values. And uh, together with the fulfillment in our social life, in profession, in art, we seek for greater fulfillment to be achieved in love. It seems that we all know what is love, but uh, at the same time, we don't really know it. Um, we cannot give it a precise definition. Like St. Augustine, uh, contemplating on the nature of time, uh, wrote, uh, what is time? If no one asks me, I know. But if I want to explain it to someone who does ask me, I do not know. And uh, the same as it seems happens with love. But if uh, for the matter of time, contemporary science and philosophy have very precise answers, love remains an enigma. In relation to this uh, question of the definition of love, a Russian-American philosopher and literary scholar, Mikhail Epstein, uh, suggested that uh, in case of love, it's better to give it not definition, but in. Finition. Infinition is a new word. It's his own word made of uh, the two, infinity plus definition. That is um, an incomplete and uh, potentially infinite definition, the process of defining something that cannot be fully or precisely defined, an open list of possible definitions. And uh, in the case of love, uh, it also shows, uh, as I believe, the profound poetry of the infinite associated with love. Also, almost everything about love is strange, isn't it? It is full of paradoxes. It is uh, very controversial. And one of the strange things about love is the language related to it. Love can hardly be described in the words, uh, yet uh, different languages give different names to it. And uh, these names, they affect the way we understand and uh, experience this ineffable, indescribable thing. And uh, some philosophers actually believe that um, love uh, lives in words, lives in the realm of language, even if words fail to represent it. In my title to this series, The Amore on Love, Piri Erotos, I included words from three languages, from Latin, De Amore, from English, on love, and from Greek, Piri Erotos, about eras. And if the English word love may signify any kind of love, love of a mother to a child, love to one's fatherland, love of God, love to one's partner, or insane passionate love obsession as well, it's all the same word. And the, the most we can do to specify it is to say fall in love, if this is what we want to say, or we should distinguish it in another way. And uh, this is the reason why with words in Latin and in Greek, I try to show that my subject is closer to this falling in love, to romantic and erotic love. In Latin, uh, the word amore uh, has a connotation of romance, and actually the words romance and romantic themselves come from the name of the Roman Empire, and we shall see how. In the Greek language, there are at least, at least four words for love, philia, for love friendship, storyi, for tenderness and care, like what mother feels to a child, then agapi, for love in its universal meaning, or in some contexts, the highest love as the love of God, and eros, the word for passionate desire. And uh, in my lectures, I will focus on the last one. Although uh, it should be said that uh, even this land of erotic love is uh, very vast because on the one side it connects to lyrical poetry and philosophy and in some cases to theology, mysticism and alchemy. On the other side it connects to sexual relationships and their regulation on the themes of uh, sexuality and gender. And uh, on the third side it connects to marriage that is economical, legal and political relations. Well, what uh, interests uh, me uh, more is uh, poetry and philosophy of love. That is something that belongs more to the realm of a dream and uh, utopia rather than uh, practical matters. But then um, the one who seizes uh, the most of the unreal seizes the most of the real. 
as uh, Georgia Agamben uh, puts it, and uh, dream and utopia, they, of course, go hand in hand with other aspects of love as a partnership, a community, political life, and other social phenomena of the most pragmatic uh, presence and influence. Another strange thing about uh, love is that uh, even though we experience it in a deeply personal way, it has a history. In other words, uh, people haven't always been falling in love the way they do now, and also they haven't been falling in love in exactly the same way in different cultures around the globe. And uh, we can see how it uh, changed with the time and how the idea of love uh, varies in different cultures. Uh, the passionate attitudes and uh, behaviors, they vary dramatically from one culture to another or from one temporal period to the next. And uh, in some times and places, people worship desire and passion as sacred power, while in others, they condemn it as dangerous and malice teaching to control affections, to prosecute them, and to be ashamed of them. So in um, this uh, series of short video lectures, I want to travel through the intellectual history of um, Western culture to see it as a history of love, to see how the idea of love emerged, how it changed, and how it is uh, changing uh, still, uh, to see its cultural diversity. And uh, my guideline, it leads from Shumer and ancient Israel to ancient Greece, then to Roman Empire and Byzantium, then to the Middle Ages, influenced by Arabic world, then to the Renaissance, then modern period, then the 19th, the 20th and the 21st uh, centuries. And um, today, for a short overview, I will give just a few examples um, to show how the idea of relationships and the erotic love has been changing over the centuries and how controversial and uncertain it was in every era. The very first love poem in human history, at least from what we know now, it was written in Shumer, Mesopotamia, at around 2000 years before current era, or maybe even earlier, because some sources dated back to 3500 or even 4000 BC. But the current version found by archaeologists, it is a clay table which addressed the poem to the king Shu Sin, who ruled on the age of the second and the first millennium BC. And it is believed that the poem is a script for the sacred marriage, uh, that is, a rite in which the king would ma uh, symbolically marry Inanna, the Shumerian goddess of love, fertility and prosperity. And uh, this poem, it is uh, deeply lyrical, it's full of uh, sweet tenderness and devotion. But um, around the same time, in the same region, we witness any but poetical attitudes towards, uh, towards real marriage, when in uh, 1775 uh, BC, in the region of contemporary Syria, the king of the ancient city of Mari, on the banks of uh, Ephrates, named Tsimrilin, marries Shiptu, the princess of the neighboring kingdom of Yamhat. And uh, this marriage is purely transactional. It happened only to establish trade between the kingdoms and this way to increase the wealth of the country. And then uh, Tsimrilin, he applied the same policy to his children when he marries eight of his daughters to the rulers of neighboring kingdoms. And of course, the idea of love uh, in uh, marriage was the last thing to interest him. And then we see that the same happens for the most powerful, um, for the most uh, powerful people of the ancient world. They marry for political reasons. And um, in fact, marrying for purely practical reasons, it was commonly accepted during the most time of human history and in most culture, cultures till very recently. While the opposite thing, the romantic and erotic affairs, were considered something completely different. And in the story with the Shumerian poem, we see the rise of the development of this attitude, of this division. We see how practical matters govern the marriages in reality, while erotic dream and pleasure, they belong to the world of the divine. This uh, Shumerian love poems, it belongs to the ritual of sacred marriage between the king and the goddess. An exception, though, can be found in uh, Byzantium, 
where love and fidelity in marriage, they were praised both in literature and in practice. Uh, for example, the emperor Justinian I in the middle of the 6th century married Theodora and made her empress, despite of the fact that she was very humble origins and even had some difficult past, uh, so to say. And uh, then they lived and ruled uh, together happily for the next 20 years till her death. And uh, the reflection of this ideal of love and fidelity in marriage, it, it can also be found in early Russian literature, like in the tale of Peter and Fevronia of Muro. But generally, the tendency to affiliate uh, love with uh, the world of the divine and the sacred, it can be observed in the entire history of our culture. Love is something close to gods in polytheistic religions or to God in monotheistic. In medieval and Renaissance era, we meet uh, religious mystics who address God as their beloved, as their partner. And... Uh, in the lyrical poetry of the time, uh, Beloved is worshipped almost as a deity, and uh, the image bears the features of the divine, of something that uh, exceeds the human, that exceeds uh, mortality and ephemeral character of human life. So from what we see, humans always uh, dreamt of uh, marrying gods and uh, goddesses, and uh, even modern poetry, the poetry of the godless world, often carries this dream. And uh, further on, uh, similar to the Shimerian, similar division between the practical and the divine, and as a consequence, an attempt to overcome this division, it can be seen in the times when the Old Testament of the Bible was written in ancient Israel at around 6th, 3rd centuries BC. While uh, in reality, free sexual relations were very restricted and marriages were organized by parents, one of the books of the Old Testament uh, contains the Song of Songs, uh, also known as the Song of King Solomon, which is one of the most beautiful, profoundly erotic love poems ever written. And uh, the researchers date this poem back to the 10th century, yet the fact that it was included into the late, later Holy Scripture shows that it was significant and appreciated as sacred. In another era, in the late uh, 5th, early 4th centuries uh, BC in ancient Greece, Eros itself was a deity, was a son of the goddess of love. And there in ancient Greece, in uh, democratic Athens, a philosopher Socrates, whom we know from the works of his student Plato, he was uh, married to a woman named uh, Xantippe and had children with her. While the matters of love he discussed with his male friends and uh, these discussions about Eros and the uh, desire for goodness and Eros was understood as such as desire for goodness, desire for philosophical knowledge and immortality, then it was written down a bit later at around uh, 385-380 BC and it gave rise to what we all now know as uh, platonic love. Although nowadays the idea of platonic love is uh, often misunderstood and uh, not as popular in general, but in the past, in the era of Renaissance, that is in the 15th and the 16th century, the Plato's ideas about love, they had such a big significance that almost all the poetry of Renaissance can be studied now as a part of uh, neoplatonist uh, philosophy. The Renaissance uh, idea of love was influenced as much by Christianity, not only ancient Greece, but also uh, in early years it was influenced by Arabic culture. And uh, this is not a very well-known fact, but uh, in the 11th, uh, 12th uh, centuries in southern France, the poetry of troubadours, court poets who invented Corteo's love, it was influenced by Arabic poetry, partly of poetry of religious mysticism addressing Allah as uh, eternal beloved, like that of uh, Rabia of Basra in the 8th uh, century. Although the same um, sensual evocations to God we can see in some medieval and Renaissance Christian mystics in uh, Europe, where religious mysticism was full of uh, disguised or not as disguised eroticism as well. 
Uh, however, altogether, it made the courteous love of uh, troubadours possible. And uh, just to give an example from historical reality, it made it possible for a noble troubadour, Geoffrey Rodel, the Prince of Bly in France, uh, in 1147 to set sail for Tripoli, in, uh, it is in modern Lebanon, um, just to see some countess of uh, Tripoli with whom he had fallen in love deeply without even seeing her. And he wrote for her numerous poems and songs expressing grief and joy of his love and uh, went on her journey there just to write some more poems in her presence. Well, it happened that uh, on the way he fell sick and so he arrives to Tripoli completely ill and um, the Countess hears about his arrival and comes to visit him and then miraculously in her presence he recovers momentarily but unfortunately just before dying and eventually dies chastely in her arms. And uh, from the story we see that as a rule uh, troubadours who dedicated all their poetry to love and to love to one and only lady. They did not expect any response and usually had no sexual relations with their object of admiration and very often no relation with their lady at all. Troubadours, they influenced early European poets of love as uh, Dante Alighieri, famous for his eternal love to Beatrice and uh, Petrarch, famous for his eternal love to Laura. And uh, this ideal of love also nourished by chivalry novels. Uh, later, it will be revived by the attempts of romantics to bring the ideal of love to life, to, to make it real. And uh, if before uh, the romantics, love and marriage were still commonly divided in the West, as I said, then in the beginning of the 19th century, the most rebellious European youth, uh, they began marrying for love. Another example, in uh, 1812, uh, in Scotland, at a place called Gretna Green, a couple got married in a secret ceremony. It was uh, John uh, Lambton, the first Earl of uh, Durham, who married Harriet, the legitimate daughter of Marquis George Calmondeley and married her despite of the fact that she had no money and uh, social status, but only because she was pretty and he fell in love with her. And then uh, later this place in Scotland, uh, Gretna Green, it became famous for this reason and it became popular destination for runaway marriages and the symbol of, uh, a symbol of uh, liberation in love well, for that century. Of the writers, uh, Jane Austen was uh, one of the first authors who promoted marriage for love. And uh, later, of course, there were many, many others, um, like Leo Tolstoy, for example, shown the marriage without love and um, following adultery in the most dramatic way in his Anna Karenina. And the nuances of emotional life of lovers, they were discovered and cherished on thousands and thousands of pages of uh, classical novels of the 19th uh, century. But uh, love as uh, the search for the divine, or at least something higher than the everyday life, it uh, never left. And uh, the ideal of eternal love that governed in the late medieval era and uh, the Renaissance, it can be found, for example, unexpectedly in the love story of Russian Soviet poet Vladimir Mayakovsky and Lilia Brick, who was his muse, uh, through his entire life, despite of the fact that uh, she was married and had other lovers. Mayakovsky, uh, of course, is more famous as a poet of revolution and socialism, but his love poems are the most poignant and uh, beautiful. Another Russian poet of um, this period, Evgeny Zamyatin, he described the totalitarian state in his novel, We, that uh, became the first book of the genre dystopia known now, and it influenced uh, later Orwell and Huxley. And uh, in this book, love becomes the power of resistance and rebel turning from romantic dream into the reason for political action. Generally, the 20th century that introduced psychoanalysis as the new theory of love 
It made us uh, rediscover our cultural history from an um, entirely new perspective. Although, uh, very often still, this perspective is misunderstood as uh, diminishing the pristine dimension of love, while in fact, um, it does the opposite. And the psychoanalysis, for example, in Jacques Lacan's version, it uh, only reassures love as ineffable, enigmatic, paradoxical force that dwells in the realm of meaning.